Welcome back to the Whole Person Podcast. I am so glad that you're listening to this episode because I get to talk to a new friend of mine by the name of Kyle Sullivan. And him and I have a lot in common in terms of our background and and some of our personal beliefs and even similar struggles and results. And we just wanted to kind of have a conversation, not really an interview about where we're both at in our lives, what we're both learning on, what we're both struggling at, and just have an open dialogue to where we just get to share it with you. And hopefully this resonates with your heart and your mind. So without any further ado, Kyle Sullivan, welcome to the Whole Person Podcast, man. How are you? Doing really well, Evan. Thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to be on your show, and uh, it's uh, it's been really cool to be connected to the podcast as a listener, and now to uh, have this conversation. It's going to be really cool. Good man. Well, just out of curiosity, what's been your favorite uh, podcast that you've listened to so far? So I really love the one with Keith Yaki. Um, and he uh, was so practical in, you know, started talking about, you know, both in real estate, you as a realtor, him as an investor, and just the the extreme practicality of his, uh, his advice and just his, how he delivered stuff. I really, really enjoyed that one. Yeah, he, uh, I've been working in communication with him to get him for like over a year. And finally, finally, we tracked it down and, and made it happen. But he's, he's a good dude. Um, yeah. I, re- I really enjoyed that conversation with him. So, well, man, Kyle, just give people a little slice of pie of, of Kyle. Who are you? What are you made of? And your story. Yeah, man. Uh, so first and foremost, um, a husband of seven years to my wife, Ginger. Um, we have a little girl. That Is she a redhead turned. by chance? So it's really funny. She was born a redhead, um, but her hair kind of shifted to blonde. Um, so it was really funny when I first met her and she's like, oh, my name's Ginger. I was like, you should have red hair but you're a blonde. Um, it would have been real funny if, uh, it would have been real funny if she had red hair, but we, uh, she's a blonde and we have a little girl who is one years old, uh, just turned one a couple weeks ago. And so we're new parents. And for the last 11 years, I've been in ministry, um, as a intern to pastor, associate pastor, all different variations of, of the ministry I served in. Um, but now as of three, almost four months ago, launched a consulting business, taking all of what I'd learned in ministry and business prior to, to help um, people overcome their, their mindsets and be able to create the life they want. Just out of curiosity, you know, what have been some of the mindset struggles that you've had in your own life that you've had to learn to be self-aware of? Oh my gosh. Such a great question. I think the, the first one is that I can actually do what I think is inside of my head. So what I mean by that is the whole phrase that we get told when we're a kid, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And I think as a kid, we believe that, but something happens when we have struggles, we have adversity, we have circumstances that uh, would tell us that that's not the case then we we retreat back to comfort we retreat back to safety even if we wouldn't call it that that is the thing we go back to and so for me it is overcoming the things i don't know it's understanding that uh, one of my favorite quotes is that we don't have to be great to start but we have to start to be great and it's just that mentality of what is the thing you can do today you may have a future vision for your life. You may have something that you want to happen by the time you retire, by the time you leave something to your kids. When we, we go to, um, you know, when we're older, but what is the thing you can do today? And I think for me, it's understanding that the small wins over time produce the results. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, 
I agree with that. You know what you're saying. I think one of my favorite quotes recently is by Gary Vaynerchuk, where he says, you underestimate what you can do in a lifetime, but you overestimate what you can do in a year. And so people put this perspective of like, oh my gosh, I'm not seeing my dreams come true. And it's only been three months, you know, and then tend to, to just quit. Right. But I think for me, one of the struggles in mindset that I've had is that I just won't be good at it Mm. or that I will start it. It won't be good. I've wasted time, energy, and effort, and it'll all be for nothing. Yeah. Um, or that I'm not worthy enough to to create said content or to create, um, you know, some sort of idea, dream, or goal. And it's really funny because I'm in this. I'm 32. I have two boys and we're getting ready to have our third boy on November 6th. Okay. You know, so we're right around the corner from, from having him three weeks out. And I've been in my vocation within real estate. Now Um, I will finish my seventh year in November leading into starting my eighth. And when I started real estate, I was so wet behind the ears. I just didn't know what I didn't know. And now, you know, I just passed as of like over the weekend, I just passed my broker's schooling to become a real estate broker to actually be able to own a brokerage if I want. And it just, it, I've stuck with real estate over time to where I've been punched in the mouth and in the stomach enough to where I've learned from pain and suffering. And that doesn't alleviate future pain or suffering, but it makes me more learned. Yeah, come on. And because I'm more learned, I'm more experienced because as I'm more experienced, I don't get easy as frustrated or frazzled and I can build upon failures. And I think so many times individuals, including myself, or at least I used to be this way, is that we don't think we can build on our failures, that, Mm. that we can only build on our successes. But honestly, like the man who has a lot of success without failures is a dangerous individual. Right. If you think about it, because I mean, without failure, what have you really learned? You've gotten lucky, you know, but if you're a student of your failures, then maybe, maybe you can have the success after failure, after failure, after failure. I don't know. Yeah. That was just kind of coming to me. I love that. And as you said, you know, I've been punched in the mouth, punched in the stomach. There, there's so much to that. Mike Tyson says that everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> and so like what I tell my clients is, yeah, it's, it's okay to get hit in the mouth. you got to learn to like the taste of blood. Like you, there's something you see, like, I don't know if you watch boxing or MMA or whatever, but like, yeah, there's something about the guys that you can tell they like to be hit. Now I think they are insane individuals it makes for great fights, but I think they're insane. There's always like in movies and stuff where the guy gets punched and he just like looks at him. It's like, Oh, you're about to get crushed because the person you just swung on actually likes to be hit and so it's this it's this mentality that we have to like the taste of the blood because it means that we're we're getting stronger it means that we're moving forward it means that we are taking what we have and going man i didn't like that what can i learn from that how can i move my head how can i you know whatever the case may be for what we're going towards and i love what you're saying of like i stuck with it because there was probably a commitment there. There was a, there was a belief that, man, uh, eventually there's going to be breakthrough. And I'm sure you've had, you know, success and, and failures and you're able to build upon both of them. Right. You know, as you're sharing that, um, I, I like MMA and UFC and stuff. And so occasionally I'll watch, you know, if there's a really good fight, I'll watch the, uh, the exhibitions and the undercards and stuff like that. But I was watching this highlight of a UFC fight where this guy got hit in the face. And I mean, it caught him off guard, but 
to kind of like show it didn't phase him. He walks up to the guy and then like invites him to hit him three more times in the face. And I'm like, dude, you're stupid. Like, don't do that. <laughs> but no, you're right. Like there's this insane mentality of not after being hit, being able to deal with it and move on. And I think that comes to self-efficacy, self-awareness, mm-hmm. yeah. emotional intelligence. Yep. And you know, that's something that I hadn't had in my life growing up. And I probably learned it, the, the concepts probably around 24, 25, yeah. and then started developing it since then. What, uh, what's been your journey like of learning self-efficacy and emotional intelligence and developing self-awareness? Oh man, it was, I think the foundation was built with my dad. Um, I mean, my dad, I was born when my dad was a senior in high school. And so he, he was a hard worker. He, um, did whatever he had to do to provide. And so I think the foundation of just hard work, motivation, drive, like commitment to what, to see things like finish. Um, and then when I was a part of a church based out of Oklahoma called life church, um, the leadership development culture really just blew up something inside of me where it's so focused on your leadership development, your personality profile, your strengths, how to maximize your strengths, how to minimize your weaknesses, how to um, become the most aware of yourself, others, and the people that you lead. That was really the journey for me where I sat under incredible leaders that taught me how to be aware, taught me how to understand myself at a level that I had never thought about before. And even now, like, I, I have a coach that I work with that that brings those things out of me. I have mentors that I meet with, that I talk to, that are in various areas of my life to, to pull things out of me that otherwise I wouldn't be able to see. And so I think it's our own personal journey of doing the work of understanding us, but then also having people that are emotionally detached from our situation to be able to speak into it objectively. Yeah. I, you know, for individuals that might not be in church leadership or a role where, where they're in that environment, because when I was in real estate, man, it was very much a, you know, there's a saying that your business grows to the extent that you do. And so there's Mm. a huge emphasis on personal growth and development. And I thank God that I chose this career, uh, or it was kind of thrusted upon me because of that. Mm. And then because of that, it, it has helped me in so many other areas. But for people who, you know, don't get that out of a company or out of a church, I'm just trying to think, man, what are some places and some ways that someone can grow in that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think first and foremost, podcasts like this, um, you have to expose yourself to different ways of thinking you have to expose yourself to different books um i mean there is a like one of my favorite things to say is is books podcasts and youtube are like the cheat code of life today like if there is anything that you want to learn you don't have to go buy a manual there's been so many things that i have thought hmm I got to put this thing together. I mean, we, you know, our little girls won. There's a lot of stuff that had to be put together in preparation for that. I'd get the instructions and I'd be like, somebody's got to have made a YouTube video on how to do this. And I just watched people do it. And so books, podcasts, YouTube, like to say that we don't know how to do something is to say that we don't want to know how to do it bad enough to go find the answer. Um, I think Facebook groups, um, have been huge for me to connect with people that are doing what I'm doing steps ahead of me. Uh, I think being able to, if you're like, okay, I want to learn this thing, type it into a search bar and see what happens. 
like you're going to get a lot of information that is probably way too much, not enough, really good and really bad, but you have to get started. And so it's okay. I have this thought. I want to learn how to fill in the blank. Okay. How to do the thing you want to do. And so it's, I think sometimes people and myself included, we overcomplicate the starting process when really we could go to our local bookstore or, you know, the podcast app on your phone or YouTube and find out that somebody has probably done what we're wanting to do. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I'm going to, I'm going to say something that someone once said to me and well, I'll just say who it was. It was Gary Vaynerchuk and he didn't say it to me personally. He said it on one of his videos and it just resonated. He said, if you're one of those individuals that are consistently consuming content, but taking no action, stop consuming my content and go take action. And I was like, yes. Oh my God, that's me. And so then I went and, you know, started taking action. I, you know, cause I had been searching, like, I mean, here's a great example for this podcast. I think I had, studied and searched and did everything for four or five years before I actually launched it, you know, and none of it was, I mean, all I did was learn how to buy the equipment. Other than that, it took me actually getting into it to actually know how to do it because until you start putting yourself in the position to do it, you're not going to learn it regardless of what you think beforehand. And so I think you're absolutely right, man. The other part is just taking action, taking one step. You want to write a book? Think of a title. Yep. Think of, you know, a layout. Think of whatever. And, you know, that's where I'm at in the process. So, yeah, man, that's that's really, really good advice. So, one of the things that I've noticed about you is that you've lost some what seems to be some, some good amount of weight within the last yes. year, year and a half. So yeah, just out of curiosity, man, I've, I've recently lost 30 pounds come and on. I'm working to, what's that? I said, come on. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm still looking to, to, to lose more. What, um, just talk about that because I'm sure a lot of people want to, to hear your journey and, and your struggles in that area. Yeah, man. So I have lost 65 pounds this year. Oh, wow. Good job. Yeah. And I will say, so my, my journey with fitness, I have yo-yoed most of my life. And I mean, when I was in eighth grade, like if you, you scroll back a little bit on my, so I, I got real vulnerable one day on my Instagram and posted a picture of me in eighth grade when my pants didn't have a number, they just said Husky. Like I was, I was a Husky kid and I did powerlifting in high school. And so I was constantly having to gain and lose weight for different meets and things like that. And that just continued into adulthood. Just the number that I fluctuated got bigger And I justified my size because I was strong. And when I was in youth ministry, students really loved to ask me what I benched and what I deadlifted and what did I squat and all of this stuff. And that was really cool. And it gained me equity. When I got out of that, there's no adults going, bro, what do you bitch? They don't care. And so for me, it was this journey. And I will tell you, the catalyst was my daughter being born. Because when she, when Piper was born, so much shifted in me of how I viewed my career, how I viewed my fitness, how I viewed how I show up in my family. So much changed. And I mean, December of last year, Evan, I, I, I was knocking on the door at 300, bro. Mm-hmm. And the thing that people would say is, oh, you carried the weight well. Well, it's because I'm I'm a shorter guy, stocky frame, broad shoulders. Like I carried, quote unquote, the weight well. And for me, it was just coming to a point of going, I want to run around with my grandkids. And I had never thought about 
my fitness and my health in such a future tense. And one of the things that I talk to clients a lot, and one of the things I had to tell myself was, is when the when the desire of progress is more than the pain of where we're at, we'll we'll get started. We'll move forward. Mm-hmm. And so for me, man, it was it was simple. It simple, not easy. So it was okay. I'm gonna start a program that is very different than what I did. And so I would just stream stuff on my phone and it was high intensity. It was interval training. If you know, if you're familiar with it and it's a, these are things that are going to sound where you just spike your heart rate and come down. And I just got really, really, really diligent on what I put in my mouth. Like I had a mentor say, you will never outwork the fork. You'll never outwork the fork. And so for me, it was taking those small, actionable steps every single day. And because I got, I was really good at losing a lot of weight really quickly. Because being a powerlifter in high school and, and doing some of that as a, as a young adult, like I got really good at getting up to a point and going, I'm going to do this crash diet. I'm going to run around my neighborhood in a trash bag. I'm going to like... I got really good at the extremes, but the consistent weight, how I've lost it now, it was something that I had to learn and I got a coach with it and I got, I got help. And I I said, okay, I need to retrain my mind and how I view fitness. And uh, so that's been, that's been the journey over the the last 10 and a half months. That's awesome, man. For, For me, it's been a very unique journey of fitness because you know, I've steadily gained weight in my adult years. Every time my wife got pregnant, you know, we're on our fifth pregnancy, but third child, mm. um, you know, so five pregnancies, I, I gained weight. I'm not blaming yeah. on the pregnancies, but you know, sure. between that and then staying up later, watching TV caused me to eat more. And yep, yep. I also had a very unhealthy addiction with soda. I mean, mm. bro, I, I, I used to be able to pound 32 to like 48 ounces of soda a day. And then one day it caught up with me and it made me sick consistently. And then mm. it still took me years, even though I knew it made me sick and I had to feel like crap. It took me years to just stop drinking it. Wow. And in the between time, so like 2019, I uh, had a knee dislocation and a torn ligament. Um, And it was my fourth one, I believe. And so that, that made losing weight a little bit more difficult because now I'm not active. And then the year before that, dude, I pulled my groin and I look at these football players that pull their groin and they're out a week and then they're back. Dude, I don't know how they did it. I was I was out 10 months. Like wow. Like it I I was dumbfounded by by the length it took to recover. So I had two years of injuries back to back that prevented mm. me from really getting around. And then my weight during those two years spiked like 40, 50 pounds. Like it was oh, yeah, yeah. huge. And this year, 2020, I'm more mobile than I've been the past two years. Wow. Um, I still have knee pain. Sure. Um, you know, I can't, I can't squat down, you know, I just can't like my, my knee will scream in pain if I do that. Mm. And so the reason why I'm sharing this is because you said something very key is I used to lose weight like this, but I can't do it that way anymore. I have to change the way I approach this. And for me, I had to change the way I approach losing weight because it went from being able to do a lot of physical activities to what you said. I can't outwork the fork. I literally can't. And so now I'm mowing my yard. Now I'm playing a little bit more. I'm walking. I, can't run um Mm. 
but I'm, I'm a little more active, yep. but I've had to mainly do it in cutting out sugars. Yep. Um, and don't get me wrong. I will still pound boxes of candy, Yeah, but not as often, not every right. day. And I'm not drinking pop anymore. And I'm just a lot more careful. And so again, I say all that to say, sometimes when we're not having success in life and we're constantly seeing repetitive failures, I think what we need to do is reevaluate the way that we're doing it. Because if we're doing it and it's not working and we're failing, then we have to re uh, refine the way of doing it. Yep. Yeah. 100%. I talked to a Navy SEAL and this will, by the time our episode comes out, his will already have come out with Tom Shea. But dude, so like the most intense training is Hell Week in the Navy SEALs. Yep. He made it to Hell Week six different times. All right. But every time during Hell Week, he got injured or he Jeez. had pneumonia or he did something. And so imagine going through SEAL training six times, getting to the very end, and then having to quit. Like, imagine the mental Lord. fortitude of that. Yeah. And he basically said, look, I had to realize going into it my last time that I can't be the guy that's going to win every challenge and try to beat everyone out. He goes, I stopped trying to win challenges, and I just tried to finish and finish healthy. I didn't try to hurt my, like I didn't ex, uh, exasperate myself to the point where I could get injured. And so I just had to change my approach and that yep. just spoke volumes. Yeah. 100%. And I think it's to being willing, being willing to adjust because I think so often we get in these habits, these routines, the, the way that we do things, if they're productive or counterproductive, but we're used to it. And so we have to get to a place where we acknowledge, and you talked about self-awareness earlier, we have to get to a place of going, what I'm doing isn't working or my desire has changed. So my behavior has to change. For me, I didn't mind carrying extra weight when my desire was to hit a certain number on my deadlift or my squat or my bench press or whatever. So my desire was to be strong. Well, you don't see any really lean strong man, like the strong man competition. They're all big, but that's their desire. Well, when my desire became, I want to be able to run around with my grandchildren when my daughter is just one that shifts how we have to do things. And so being willing to redefine and realign our desires to our behavior is so important in personal growth. Yeah. Out of the faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, and fun, what, uh, what other topic really sticks out to you that, that you want to just kind of share about? Oh man. I, I think I love the, the friendship side of things because one of the one of the things i think when having when having people in our lives is sometimes i i talk about it in the way of uh of scaffolding and foundation so there are people in our life that are foundational to us um our spouses our our children mentors coaches People who it it doesn't mean they've been in our life a long time, but it means that once they're in our life, we realize, okay, this is going to be a long term thing. There's other people that are scaffolding. They help us get to a certain level, much like when a building is being built or remodeled or whatever. But then if the scaffolding isn't removed, both the building and the thing, it looks foolish because the season has ended for that thing to be removed. And so I think a lot of times people don't evaluate their friendships enough. And, and I think it's because we, we want to, we want to, well, I've been friends with them for 10 years. I've been friends with them for X amount of time. They've done so much for me in the past. They've done, but 
a lot of times we, as we grow, we have to understand that like everybody that has come with us to this point doesn't mean that they're going to go with us to where we're going. And that's a really hard thing to acknowledge and be okay with moving forward. There's people, there's people in my life that at a certain time and season, I talk to them every week, sometimes every day, but now I don't have the relationship with them because of either, you know, I'm not, we're not in proximity to each other. Like we used to be, we're not in relationship, how we were, the the interests have changed. The desires have changed, whatever that is. And I think initially myself, I know I could speak for me and maybe, you know, your listeners is that when a relationship is, is ended, it, it hurts like it should hurt. But I think we have to, in the, in the lens of friendship, we have to acknowledge that there are seasons of life and there's seasons of relationships and we have to be okay with that. Um, allowing those things to ebb and flow as we need it. Mm. Dude, I love your analogies on this. Let me give another analogy that kind of popped to mind because I'm taking what you're saying to heart. Have you, you know what a kaleidoscope is? Mm -hmm. So I remember playing with kaleidoscopes and rolling them around and rolling and all the pieces are falling and nothing like it just, it's chaos. And then all of a sudden there's this beautiful picture Mm. of just different colors. And I feel like at different times and when you roll it, it's never the same picture either. Friendships are kind of like kaleidoscopes. You know, they they come in and out of focus at different times, but at the end of your life and you look back at it, it's going to paint a beautiful picture. Yeah. But in order for new friendships to come in, sometimes old friendships disintegrate. And when I say disintegrate, not specifically in a, in a bad way, sometimes they do, but sometimes it's just like you said, proximity or, or things change. You know, I, five of my best friends that I've ever had in my life, only one of them lives near me. And even right right now, that one friend and I, I mean, there's no ill will towards each other, but I've noticed this year we just really haven't hung out a lot. You know, Mm. we have a couple of different viewpoints, um, you know, that eh, sure. we wouldn't say, oh my gosh, I'm going to disagree with you because of this and not be friends. No, it's just, you know, it causes us to think and act a certain way. And I think maybe because him and I th- are starting to think a little differently than one another, we just sure. have kind of grown apart. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. but if you're listening to this, my friend, which you probably aren't, feel, feel free to call me. Um, <laughs> Come on. He he knows who he is. But um on, on a real level though, I really like that idea of the scaffolding because one, it it is a level. It, it does get you to the next step. And it's not just about you, but you've done that for the other person. But then yep. at the end of the day, after the building's complete, it all comes down. Yep. That's really good. I really yeah. like that. I'm not I'm not gonna try to add too much to that because I just Awesome. I, I don't well, I feel like I need to. I that was something I was driving uh downtown Tulsa and everything's always under construction. And it was one day that I was like the building like everything had been cleaned up, but the scaffolding was had not been taken away yet. And I had the thought of like, man, how many people are walking around and that's their life? They have something that is that should have been removed, but isn't. And so it looks, it looks silly. It's a hard place to get to though. Yeah. Because there's emotion tied to it. But I think for me, it's understanding that we think we're thankful for the season that we had. And it doesn't mean much like what you were saying with your friend, like we were really close for a long time. And now because of, fill in the blank we're not and you know i think about that's that's just that's just people that's just friendship well and you know to to give more clarity to that for people that are listening to um he got married again uh and he he married into a family with 
with children. And so, you know, he went from, you know, being a single father to a father of golly, let's see five and another one on the way. So like life yeah, changes sure. yeah. Yeah, and, and it's okay. Yep. Ask me a few questions, man. Man, I, so what, what would you say, you know, you, you ask people about their journey every, so every, every podcast. I love that. Um, what is the thing right now that you're really holding on to that is helping you grow? <sighs> um, I would say the thing that has been helping me grow is I won this podcast. Like I've seen a lot of personal growth since I've started, like mm. almost in hyperdrive. And then the other thing, I mean, my career in real estate, I'm in the process of becoming a broker or get my broker's license. Mm -hmm. And so my career has driven me for personal growth. Um, so career wise, you know, those are areas that I'm seeing personal growth in just because I have a desire to level up and mm. it requires me to create more opportunities for my future. So like right now, you know, I could go broadcasting. I could go being a broker in charge. I could start my own real estate company. I can, you know, yep. I have options. Sure. I don't know what I'm going to do with those options yet, but I've created options. And then out of those options, I'm waiting to see what God does. Yeah. Because so many times in my past, I have just ducked my head and ran into the door trying to force things open mm. and walking away with massive headaches. Yeah. And I think I know the direction that God's going to lead me towards. Um, I don't know when it will be. Right. I don't know what it will look like specifically, but you know, there's been, and I don't want to sound stupid or crazy here. I am an evangelical Christian. And a part mm. of that is we do believe that God can talk to us. Yeah, and sometimes sure. it comes through the word of God itself. Sometimes God will give you dreams and he'll give you the interpretation or sometimes other people give you the interpretation. There's yeah, this other sure. thing called a prophetic word where mm -hmm. God gives someone a specific word for that individual. And this year I've received two prophetic words that were very identical from people who didn't know each other. And not only did they not know each other and they were identical, one of them, which was really crazy. I had a dream that an individual had a prophetic word for me. And that it would be the last prophetic word that, th that this person would give me. Okay. So I forgot about the dream. I wake up later that day. I remembered, I called this individual. He's like, yeah, I've had one for two years, but I've never given it to you because I don't feel like the time is right. Apparently the time wow. is right. So he gave it to me. Six months later, he dies. Jeez. And so not only did he have the prophetic word, but in the dream, it was the... I mean, I, I look at my journal. Yeah. It says it was the last prophetic word he'd give me. And I didn't understand that. Um, but then he passed away. And so then that brought more understanding. So for me, an area of personal growth is just kind of holding on to some of the promises that I believe God has laid out before me. Come on. And because I can look at God's promises, that doesn't mean I have to go make them happen. I have to wait upon the Lord. Right. And, and that's my journey. Sometimes God's going to ask you to do something. There, yep. there, there's Christians that try to get ahead of God, which I'm that type. And then there's Christians that sit and do nothing. And God's asking you to move. Right. I, I'm the kind that gets ahead, ahead of God. And so for me, just to know that God still has a plan, that he still has a specific purpose and that he wants me to wait on him. So that's, that's been really encouraging to help me finish this season strong. Yeah. And what's crazy, I remember around January 1st, I wrote on my whiteboard and it's still there. 2020 will be the best year of my life for two reasons. One, 2020 is a cool year, you know, like 
<laughs> the way it right. looks. And then 32 is my favorite number and I'm 32. So I'm like 2020 yeah. and I'm 32. It's going to be the best year of my life. And I'm not kidding you. And, and I say this with all sincerity because I know a lot of people can't say this. It has been the best year of my life. Right. It, I've seen a lot of, a lot of breakthrough, a lot of success, um, mental health, my mental health is better now than it's been in years. But I have also seen way more areas that I struggle in. You know, I've become more right. self-aware. I've, I've gone right. through counseling and psychology and, you know, so all these things combined are helping me grow and, and develop. Um, and then also just to provide a better environment for my kids you know, yeah. that, that's an area that means a lot to me. And I feel like I suck in, mm. um, I, but I, I know I don't, it's just, it's just negative self-talk. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you said so much there that is, that is important. It's, you know, from 2020 is going to be the best year of my life. It's my favorite number. I'm that age. I'm the, but I think the people that, again, we surround ourselves with the people that we would say they are foundational, the people that are having great years. And again, we have to be extremely sensitive that the, you know, there's a huge pocket of people that can't say that. Yeah. But um, I'm also becoming more and more convinced that our mind goes towards our strongest thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say, I, I love because there's so so much conviction, like what would you say grounded you in making that declaration that 2020 is going to be the best year of my life? What do you think that played in what you've experienced this year? Because 2019 was a shit storm. Okay. It was, and excuse my French, but I don't know how else how to describe it. Right. My 2019 was the worst year of my life. Right. And it was a refiner's fire mm. between an injury, between combined total. So I had one injury and a surgery on my knee. And I had an emergency appendectomy. We lost a pregnancy. My wife had to go to the ER twice. I had to go to the ER once. My son had to go to the ER once. We had seven financial hits um, in that year. I wasn't working for probably four or five months because of the different surgeries I was in. Wow. Um, you know, and, and so there was just a lot of things that happened ironically it made me really go to god in a way that i hadn't yeah. gone to him in recent years and he gave me a specific direction and i followed that direction even though i didn't quite understand it it was mildly terrifying and it was one of the more recent best decisions i've ever made and wow. um i don't want to share it because it's very controversial and sure. and I don't think God would give this advice to everyone. Right. Because, because not everyone was in my situation or sure. had my mindset or upbringing or understanding. Right. And so, but it showed me through the process a couple of different things. I, I think I viewed... You know what? Let's just go for it. I just felt back then God asked me to stop tithing for for a little bit, momentarily, and which makes no sense to a evangelical Bible believing tithing Christian, right? And what I realized it wasn't right away, but it was after the fact that I was putting my faith and trust in me tithing that that would bring the blessing and not God that I mm. did this. Therefore I get this. Sure. And even though I wasn't saying that and I wasn't even really thinking that internally, that was kind of the, the stuff going on. 
And it wasn't until after I stopped tithing did I start seeing a lot of blessing. You know, financially, we paid off my student loans. We needed another vehicle. We were able to pay cash for that vehicle. We were able to pay off a lot of medical debt. We still have some, and we're about to go get into some more just because of the baby coming. Sure. But we went from being, oh, and God um, gave my wife about a 25 to 30% raise of, of income and gave me about 30% raise in my income. Wow, wow. And so we went from being, you know, two grand above poverty line to middle class. And that was, that was a game changer for our family. That was a game changer for our mindsets, but it was all because I think it's because I stopped looking at tithe as the reason why I should get blessed and trusting God for my for the provision. Mm. And because of that, we were able to get out of debt. We were able not to go into more. Well, that's the other thing. I I really felt God say, don't go into more debt. And so when we only had one vehicle, actually there, there was a moment we had zero vehicles, but there was a moment where we had the option to get debt or have no vehicle. And I chose no vehicle, which was really hard to do. God provided. Yeah. Because he said, don't go into debt. Um, and so for me, what made 2020 great is because I finished 2019 strong, Sure. even though it was a terrible year, I heard God speak. I held on to it. I listened and obeyed and I got a lot better results the following year. Mm. And then that also just kind of dominoed effect to, to stop drinking, soda into um, other personal sins that I had struggled with for my life or over my entire life um, received healing and recovery from that. So I, I, I just saw a lot of freedom from healing from, from holding on to what God asked me to do and yeah. accomplishing it. Yeah. I, I think, what you mentioned about your podcast with uh, the, the Navy SEAL, that was your own hell week it was 2019 of, I'm just going to finish this. I'm going to finish it and I'm going to get through it as, as healthily um, as possible. And so I, I love that. What do you, what do you think, what do you think people misunderstand about perseverance? Because everything you just shared is about going against the grain, feeling like you have a word, feeling like there's a a thing that you're supposed to do, but you don't know how. Um, And as people are hearing this, what is something you think they may, they may misunderstand about the journey of perseverance that you've been on that you could, you could share with them. Well, perseverance doesn't happen without struggle number one. And we all desire perseverance, but we don't desire the process to get it. And so if you're an individual that wants perseverance, you're inviting struggle into your life. Right. That's like praying for patience. (laughs) That's kind of what I was thinking when I was saying that. Um, When it comes to perseverance, I think the biggest thing that we have to to realize is that it's going to be a process of time yeah, and that you will never achieve it right off the bat. And it's at the point of break of giving up, of letting go is when you'll start seeing the success. But, but the biggest thing is, is you can't blame anybody or anything or any circumstance on where you're at, you have to take ownership of everything. And it's only in that moment of taking ownership that can you develop perseverance and have success through it. I'm the one that chose to kick the soccer ball. 
I'm the one that chose to coach soccer when I had no business coaching soccer. And that's how I hurt my knee. I'm the one that chose the vehicle that I bought that broke down. I'm the one that chose to let my wife drive my car that got in the car wreck. While I didn't choose the loss of, of a pregnancy or my family to have medical issues or me to have future medical issues, I could take ownership of the fact that they're my responsibility. Yeah. And that despite having increased medical debt, it's my responsibility to take care of and not looking at life as it's unfair. It's not right. It's not just what is going on. But to throw the idea of what is fair out of my mind. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I don't deserve anything that I have. I don't deserve my wife. I don't deserve my children. I don't deserve this house. I don't deserve salvation. But everything that I have is a gift from God. And if I can have that mindset and not blame God for my circumstances or blame God for my situations, but I can take extreme ownership of who I am and where I am in my life, then that allows God to work on my behalf when I'm not blaming other people, when I'm not blaming other things. And because of that, that's how you learn how to persevere. And that's how you see breakthrough. We'll be Great question. The, we'll be passing the offering bucket around now. <laughs> um, that was incredible, <laughs> man. Um, yeah. And I, I, gosh, there's so much there that we, we can't choose the cards we're dealt, but we can't choose how we play them. Yeah. And, and I think so much of what you what you were just saying and the conviction that you spoke with, like when people have gone through some stuff, they, they speak like it. And so just in, in hearing you talk, man, it's like, Oh yeah, this brother feels this. (laughs) He has been through it and he's going through it and he's coming on the other side of it. And you just, you just need to hear like the conviction that you speak with is like, Oh yeah, he's going to come on the other side of this. This is going to be awesome. (laughs) He's going to, this, oh. you know, old, old preacher joke of, uh, uh, sir, your mess is going to turn into your message. That's so, funny. That's awesome, man. So in terms of, let, let's go the family route. No, let, you know, what, let's go faith. Let's go, let's go faith before we go. Cause we already kind of talked about family at the beginning. You know, you and I both, are you more evangelical? Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. The okay. churches that I've, I've worked in are non-denominational, but yeah, evangelical Christian. I'm, I, I love how Louis Giglio says it. He's a, I'm just a Jesus person. Like yeah. I'm just a Jesus guy. Dude. I love Louis Giglio. So I, okay. Crazy funny story on how I met Louis Giglio. Okay. Okay. So I went to just so you guys know, Louis Giglio is a, a minister. He, he helped found a lot of uh, young musicians at one point in time, but Chris Tomlin, when, when they were doing the indescribable tour, uh, mm-hmm. I went and watched it and it was amazing. Uh, it was in Wichita, Kansas. I drove like three and a half hours away. I was 16. <laughs> and so we get to the arena or the, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I have to go, I, I have to pee really okay. bad and i get in and apparently like we didn't come in like the front gate or whatever we kind of came on the side gate or something like that and so i'm just walking around the circle arena trying to find a bathroom and apparently i kind of moseyed behind like the stage area and all that and there's this bathroom back there and i walk in and i you know i'm standing at the urinal doing my thing and then in walks louis giglio standing right beside me by the divider and there we both are doing our thing. And I look over at him and starstruck. Like I've met a whole bunch of famous people. Sure. Even before I met Louis Giglio, 
but I was actually more starstruck by meeting Louis Giglio, which was really kind of funny, but there right. we are doing our thing. And I see him and I get so excited. I'm like, you're Louis Giglio. He goes, yep. And I go, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I stick my hand over the divider to shake his hand. And very kindly, very graciously, he reached out and shook my hand. He said, Man, nice to meet you. That's, and then, that's the grace of God right there. <laughs> dude, oh, it was like, you know, I was young. I was stupid. Sure. You know, no bro code whatsoever. Right. And he just... He he oh, he probably w- he probably washed his hands thoroughly, but <laughs> it was <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. He said, "Oh, the blood of Jesus covers me. If I get a little urine on my hand, it's okay." Oh, man, <laughs> but you know, talk to me about what what's it mean to be a Christ follower to you? No, oh, let me phrase that: not just to you, but like your understanding of biblical principles. Yeah, man, I feel like that could be another whole uh, uh, the no po- podcast. I think for me, it is. I was in a place in my life. So, what does it mean to me is to have a real encounter with Jesus. So, I didn't grow up in church. Um, my dad got saved uh, when I was in eighth grade. We started going to church. It was fun, but I didn't like it. It was. Yeah, I, I didn't think it was for me. Went to all the camps, went to all the things, went to all the whatever. Um, got saved when I was uh, almost 21. And for me, it was a real understanding of what I'm doing isn't working. And much like what you talked about earlier, where I really felt like a voice of God. And it's this small feeling it's a small intuition it's this you know or sometimes it's allowed like shift in our lives and so what it means to me to be a follower of Christ is to understand that there's something now people call it all kinds of different things for those of us who follow Jesus we would call it God and it's understanding that he's in control of everything we're surprised. He's never surprised. There's a creator that everything that we experience and have and enjoy is through a source, again, God. And it's it's that understanding that what we do in our life matters. And it doesn't just matter here. It matters for eternity. And um what you do in life echoes in eternity come on come on come on now see yep that's a great movie it is uh, it, it but it's that it's that understanding that i've and i've talked to a lot of people that it it comes down to a moment in time where what i'm doing is not working so i'm i'm I feel prompted to seek this out. And I, and I love for me, I had, I had probably quite a few, what, what I call crisis of beliefs where I had to ask myself, like, do I really believe this stuff? Like if God is so fill in the blank, then why could this happen? And for me, I get to a place where I go, I don't have to understand everything. And I went to, I went to Bible college. And so I took apologetics classes and stuff. And we get to a place where it's like, I believe in my heart that this is the, the way, the truth and the life as, as the Bible says in John 15, John 14. And so for me, being as someone who follows Christ is taking the Bible as the source and following the commandments. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. In our current culture and society, and when I look at Christianity and the lack of belief in Jesus, is I think because 
people are trying to justify their own morality. Sure. And when it doesn't align up with, with something like say, say God, say Christianity, then because it doesn't justify it, then therefore it can't be believed. Yeah. And I just, I'm heartbroken to see a lot of our, the cultural, um, descent based off of what we're seeing, because we try to make God what we think he should be. We should, we think God should be fair. We think God should appear a certain way or do certain things or heal a certain person or, you know, why do bad things happen to like, we put a sure. lot of stipulations on who God should be based from our perspective. Sure. But if that was the God of everything, that would be a very small God. Mm. You know, I've in my journey, my journey is a little bit different. I am one of those kids that was saved before I was born. <laughs> sure. I mean, I grew up in church my entire life and I, that, it was a joke about being saved before I was born. That doesn't yeah. happen. Right. Um, right. But I was born into the church at three years of age. I remember committing my life to Jesus. I Come remember on. that. Yeah. Wow. I remember being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember hearing God's voice from a very early age. I remember feeling called into vocational ministry at seven years of age. And there's this idea like, okay, well, you were kind of brainwashed into it. I've had plenty of dark moments in my life to make me turn away from God and want to question God. And I did question God. I questioned God a lot. Yeah. And I allowed him to show up. But I also allowed God not to be the person who I wanted him to be. Sure. And I think that's a big difference is people only want the God that they want to allow him to be, which is creating a false idol. And even Christians do that right oh, now. Sure. We want God to act and behave a certain way that can justify yeah. our own actions or beliefs or wants. Sure. And, you know, at the end of the day, God is good no matter what. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin so that I can have forgiveness and salvation and eternity with him. You know, I was talking about this in a men's uh, online recovery group that I'm, I'm a part of and that, that I get to lead. And we were talking about purpose, individual purpose. And I was telling them how there's two purposes. There's God's generic will and God's specific will. And God's generic will is more important than God's specific will. God's specific will is for, for Kyle and for Evan, but God's generic will is for all of mankind. But at the end of the day, God's purpose, God's plan for all of our lives is for us to experience his love and goodness, to accept salvation so that we can spend eternity with him. That was the plan. That's why he created the garden so that we could dwell with him. And it's the same reason why he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. It's the same reason why he created humans knowing that they would sin and knowing that he'd have to send Jesus because the hurt, the pain, and the suffering that Jesus would have to go through is insignificant compared to the fact of how much value he puts on living an eternal life with us in heaven. We put a lot of emphasis on the crucifixion which it deserves and the resurrection. It's no small thing. But when it comes to what has God desired more, he desired for us to dwell with him. It would only come through the salvation and resurrection of our sins. So that's, 
That's Listen, my somebody about, somebody about to get saved on this podcast. <laughs> you know what? Hey, if you're listening to this and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, come on. You know what? All you have to do is say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. That's it. You don't have to have, make this big, long prayer. Just say, I believe in you. I accept you. And I want you to be Lord of my life. And then feel free to reach out to me and I can help you with the next stages of, of growth, wholeness, and well-being. Come on. But, but yeah, maybe you're going through something in life and, and you don't know where to go to. You can turn to Jesus. Just saying. Boom. Well, well, Kyle, man, thanks so much for uh, jumping on it. Before we go, man, is there anything else that you want to add or say to the podcast? Oh, heck, man. When you when you uh, deliver such a, a powerful conviction for Jesus, I think we just need to leave that uh, where it lies and and, uh, and call this good. But, man, it's such such a fun conversation uh, that we had today. And, and again, like your heart at the beginning, I think this is going to free some people and just it's going to free some people. I think eternally to God is God's going to use this one today. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening. Kyle, thanks for coming. Hope you guys all have a great day. Take care.